Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The movie Iran's progress towards nuclear weapons is seemingly being shot in slow motion, rather than a mad dash to the finish line, which could immediately also turn out to be the finish line for Iran's nuclear project, because it will be struck by countries or alliances opposed to it, the Iranians are deliberately crawling, indicating that they want a return to the 2015 nuclear deal with world powers, but on their terms. This is unacceptable to the United States and many of its partners, including Israel. Meanwhile, the International Atomic Energy Agency is increasingly at risk of operating in the dark, with its cameras, continuous coverage of certain facilities completely cut off. Is this a worsening crisis, or the storm before the calm? Joining us to deliberate the latest on Iran's nuclear advances all the way from London is retired Colonel Richard Kemp, who is a British former commander and head of the International Counterterrorism Intelligence Team at the British Cabinet Office. Thank you for joining us, Colonel. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. As always, indeed. Also joining us from across the pond in the uh, United States, in New York City, to be exact, is Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us as well, Dr. Heinonen. Thank you for having me. As always, it's a pleasure indeed. And with me here in the studio is uh, sitting in for our editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren, uh, Colonel in Reserve, Miri Eisen, who is uh, a co-panelist at TV7's Power and Play, uh, Israeli public diplomacy, security and intelligence expert at uh, the International Counterterrorism Institute uh, at Reichman University. Thank you for joining us as well, Colonel. I'd like to start by um, asking you, to what degree should the international community be alarmed by the latest developments, uh, which Iran is... Uh, at least it seems to be wholeheartedly aspiring to attain nuclear weapon capabilities. When you're sitting from Jerusalem, things look different. Sitting here in Jerusalem, not only should we be alarmed, we're talking about a ticking clock. Now, we've been talking about this ticking clock for so long, everybody's tired of listening to that. But the fact that we've been talking about it and making it not yet happen is a very important part. And that only happened because the entire international community came together against Iran achieving nuclear capability. The rhetoric that's coming out of Tehran, the rhetoric that's coming out from top nuclear scientists in Iran, the fact that they're putting them in front of the camera to almost like wave a red flag in the face of the world and saying, we can do whatever we want. This is not about that. It's the bargaining chips that Iran is trying to bring to the table is that we're, you're really going to have to try hard to stop us. And this is very alarming. That together with the hand in hand with Russia, the outsider today in that international community who was also part of these negotiations in the past, makes it all the more challenging and alarming for us to arrive at that stage. As you said before, if Iran goes down that path, there are countries out there that are going to try to stop here. None of us want to get to that point. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Heinonen at the 10th conference of the NPT earlier this week uh, in New York, uh, there were deliberations on uh, uh, non-proliferation, on disarmament, so on and so forth. Uh, all the while in Tehran, they uh, made a decision to implement uh, once again, uh, yet another decision uh, with regard to a uh, parliament-backed uh, law that obviously is uh, directed by the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, which, uh, technically speaking, just put online uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of centrifuges of IR-6 and, and so on, um, which, once again, is a significant leap, uh, from what I understand, towards uh, the the nuclear dimension of uh, breakout point towards uh, military uh, grade materials. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an understanding on this? Thank you very much. Yes, this was just another message uh, earlier this week and a couple of weeks ago from the Iranian authorities and high level officials that they have capability to produce a nuclear weapon if they decide to do so. For the time being, they have a lot of highly enriched uranium, enough enriched uranium to make, if they so decide, about half a dozen nuclear weapons during half a year in terms of the material. 
certainly it will take some time to manufacture the weapons components. And at the same time, they put table this other thing, which they say is 20 year old, the armament project plan and their nuclear weapons capabilities, which they were developing in early 2000s. They don't want the international community to address those. Why? There could be two, two reasons. One is that it might be embarrassing to the Iranian society because all along they have said that this is a civilian program. Uh, there is no hidden agenda here. But when we look at those experiments which took place, and we even see it from the satellite imagery that they were already building a nuclear weapon test site, those sort of things you don't just build unless you plan to use them. So this is one thing they want to have a waiver again on those IAEA questions. But at the same time, we don't know how far they went on that route. There are some intelligence information which says they stopped. But on the other hand, we have to remember, if we go back to 2003, they say that they stopped uranium enrichment uh, and only will do it in Natas. But one year later, they started for the project which was done in secrecy until 2009 when it was revealed. So we have to deal with a very caution uh, this situation and make sure that the IAEA gets, gets there. Iranians want to use this as a trump card, scare the people, hope that this eases the decisions in uh, T5 plus 1 in terms of the return to, to the JCPOA. This is a trump card they have and they will use it as long as we don't know what was the nuclear weapons program, has it proceeded after 2003? And we have, on the other hand, we have assurances that uh, they are not working with the, uh, to produce high energy uranium, which means that the provisions of the JCPOA need to be done, made longer and much more comprehensive. Colonel Kemp, your take? I think I think the the idea of returning to the JCPOA um, or anything like it, anything remotely like it, is ludicrous. Um, we've seen, you know, we've seen um, numerous examples, and Dr. Heinen just mentioned one of them: the deception of their own people about the purpose of their nuclear project. We've seen so many examples of Iranian duplicity, uh, of Iranian deception, of claiming one thing and doing another, of denying. Uh, access to IA inspectors when they have an obligation to do so, all of these things. And we seriously believe that we can have a realistic deal, nuclear deal of any sort with the unions, which they will honor. Of course, of course they won't. They will honor it as much as they want to and they'll ignore it when they want to. So I think the very idea of, of going back to a deal with people like this uh, is, is absurd. I mean, we saw another example of a similar type of regime about a week ago in Afghanistan, when uh, the Americans uh, assassinated Ayman al Zawakari, uh, who was being uh, harbored in Afghanistan by the Taliban against an agreement they'd made. Now, the, these regimes, you don't, you don't have agreements with them because they will not keep them. You might keep them, you might try and keep them, they won't keep them. Though. And I think it's a, a real error to, to, to continue down this path. Uh, and, and the original JCPOA, apart from which the original JCPOA, all it did really was to pave the way for a legitimate nuclear weapon for Iran in due course, once the sunset clauses had, had finished. But, I, you know, either, either way, whichever way you look at it, I think, I think it's, it's fundamentally uh, unfounded to, or, or ill-judged, should I say, to, uh, to go along with, with this kind of stuff, which might work between Western countries, or, you know, countries with different cultures. It doesn't work with Iran, it doesn't work with Afghanistan. As long as they do it with a smile, of course, Colonel Eisen. So one of the problems that I look at right now, and in that sense, both when I'm hearing both of you overseas and from your different positions, is that today in the world, not most people think like Colonel Kemp. And I say it in the sense, certainly not in the Western world. I think that Western leaders today in the summer of 2022 cannot ignore everything going on. And everything going on is Russia against Ukraine. It is the huge challenge of supplying energy to Europe 
up in the upcoming winter and suddenly oil comes into the room and suddenly you're looking at Iran in a different way. And I say that because I don't know that Western powers, be it France or Italy, be it Germany, a letter, even, I'm even going to go and say the UK, the United States is a different aspect because it doesn't bite into these same arenas, is impacted both by the Russian-Ukrainian war and because of the lack of oil coming out of Iran. That had a lot to do with President Biden's statements inside Saudi Arabia a couple weeks ago. So when I look at this general aspect, I can say, I don't want to talk to the Iranians. They're not going to keep the deal. I agree with Colonel Kemp. But if I don't talk to the Iranians and I don't arrive at something, then I am opening up the Western world, specifically the Western world, to challenges that you need to balance out. And sadly for me as an Israeli sitting here, that balance is going to be on the nuclear issue because I think that Western countries right now have an interest to arrive at something with the Iranians, and that scares me. That's why I'm alarmed. Even though we hear all those uh, statements about alternative energy and we see Mohammed bin Salman traveling to Paris and traveling elsewhere, and uh, Biden traveling all the way to Saudi Arabia to meet with uh, the Saud family just for the sake of uh, energy, all of whom are rivals of the Islamic Republic of Iran? They are all rivals, and now it's the summer. And I want to see us all talking in the fall and in the winter. And I think that right now, domestic politics in many of the European countries are still in summer mode. And when it starts to get cold and when the energy prices are going to go sky high and when people are actually cold, let alone 10 million Ukrainian refugees, people may talk otherwise. Crea uh, creating new realities instead of facing uh, uh, actual realities. Dr. Heinonen, when we're talking specifically, though, about uh, the progress of Iran's nuclear program, uh, you mentioned quite clearly uh, the fact that uh, if they want, they can attain a nuclear weapon. If they haven't already made that decision, something that other than intelligence agencies currently accumulating knowledge about what is happening behind closed doors, nobody really knows uh, to what degree the Iranians have pro made that progress uh, and whether or not they have made that leap. Of course, assessment indicates that they have not. But... Uh, are there any mo monitoring mechanisms that can produce some answers at this stage? I think that the first one here is uh, to lo look at uh, this uh, weapons program and uh, get some ease to our minds. You may recall that in 1993, when South Africa joined the NPT, first one year, they didn't tell about anything about their past nuclear program. But then they realized that they have a monkey on their shoulder and decided to come open in early 1993 about their weapons program, which they had dismantled a couple of years earlier. And they invited IAEA to confirm that all the nuclear weapons activities have been uh, dismantled, single-use equipment are, are, are not anymore there, facilities have been dismantled, and nuclear material is has been submitted to the IAEA safeguards. This is, was a, quite an undertaking. If you look at uh, South African nuclear weapons program lasted almost two decades. And we did it in a one year time, based on the cooperation of the South African authorities, we were able to go to every place of that nuclear weapons program, see the re dismantling records, see the photographs, see the videos, interview the people, and got convinced that no, there is no one piece of uh, that uh, uh, program left, except certainly in the minds of the pe uh, people who were involved. You cannot er erase their memories. But all this, which facilitated restoring of the program speedy, was uh, dismantled. And on top of that, they agreed to access by, by the IAEA inspectors any time, any place in uh, South Africa with a reason. You need to tell why you go, and then, then you got there. And I remember myself, I went to the airport and straight from there, we went to the location and there was no big debate whether I can go, whether I should wait another week or two weeks or one month. In a couple of hours, we were on that place. And I think that that is something which should be done finally with Iran. We have now the... Uh, 20th anniversary of this disclosure of Iran's program by NCRI, which took place in summer uh, 
2002, it was mid-August. And we are still facing the same questions which we faced in 2002. I think it's time to put an end to that. This is one school of thought, of course, uh, but uh, you also held the, the North Korean file and that took a completely different turn as opposed to the South African one. And it seems like the Iranians are more likely to take the track of the North Koreans. Yes, that's true. And I, I remember one of the North Korean diplomats when they left the NPT in spring 2003, I asked that uh, Son Moon-san, what's happening next? He said, don't break plutonium is our weapon. Separated plutonium. And this is what Iran is now using, the highly enriched uranium as a weapon. But then 2003 to uh, test in 2006, in less than three, six, three years, North Korea was able to conduct a nuclear weapons test. Well, certainly the decision was done based on political basis, not technical complaints were there. They decided for political reasons. Most likely the weapon test was ready well before that. And why? And what we know by now, and uh, you know, after seeing some of the other parts of North Korea, they were working all along since 1992 with plutonium metal producing uranium metal with the plutonium metal with the small quantities they had made with the weapon design, made explosive experiments, and those were all outside of the scope of the agreed framework which IAEA was monitoring. I didn't have access to those places. And I caution here you, for that si simple very reason that we don't uh, repeat the same mistake as General uh, Kemp suggested uh, with Iran. It has to be very comprehensive agreement and not uh, just based on wishful thinking. If it was up to me, I would promote Colonel Kemp also to General. But Colonel Kemp, I'd like to ask you specifically, uh, when we're talking about uh, the current state of play vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, are the E3, Germany, Britain, uh, and France, reliable enough at this stage to be able to stand up, considering what Colonel Eisen already mentioned about uh, political will and political realities, domestically speaking. Uh, and at the same time, of course, the practitioners are very competent. Uh, uh, we uh, may know uh, about uh, some of those countries who have uh, managed to unveil some portions of uh, Tehran's nuclear capabilities. Uh, to what degree is there a disconnect between the political echelons and the practitioners making that important work on the field? I think, I think you know, certainly in Britain, and I'm, I'm guessing also in other European countries, and without a doubt in, in Israel and the US, there is a great deal of access to what's going on in Iran in relation to its nuclear program. There's a great deal of understanding. Um, and, and, and that that information is, is certainly being fed into the political leadership one way or another. Um, but I, I really do fear, um, much along the lines of Colonel Eisen's view, I, I really do fear that there is not the political will within Britain, France, Germany, uh, or, or indeed any other European country um, to, to, to stand up against this uh, situation, to take a firm line. I think, I think for one thing, and certainly in the case of Britain, Britain will uh, almost certainly go along with the, the whatever line the U.S. is taking on this. Not when President Trump was in power, they, they, they didn't approve of what he was doing, but they, I believe, will go along with whatever line Biden takes. And I don't think that'll be a hard line either. Um, so I, 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 I don't, yeah, I think there is, in answer to your question, really, I think there is a big disconnect between what um, you know, what the, the experts and the intelligence services uh, know about the situation and what the political leaders are prepared to do about it are two different things. I, I would uh, say one thing, which is that in the UK, we have a, a leadership election, which will in sometime in September probably give us a new prime minister. And I think it depends to a large extent which of the two current candidates is the prime minister. One of them, I believe, is uh, an unusually strong 
candidate and is likely to take a much more independent line on matters like Iran and has done in the past. The other one, um, I, I'm not so sure about, but I think the, the reality is that, you know, when, when you're looking at the situation in, in the wider sense, the Ukraine situation, the energy situation and all of that, I think that there's a real tendency among Western European leaders to, including, you know, my own country, to, um, to, to, to look really at their own immediate interests, their immediate political interests, rather than longer term dangers that some of us might perceive. And certainly, you know, from an Israeli perspective, those dangers are, I think they're far more obvious to the leadership in Israel than they are an immediate threats than they are in Europe. Europe ten, European leaders, I think, tend to see things, they send, tend to look at countries like Iran as if they're their own countries. They don't really understand the differences between Iranian thinking and their own kind of rationale and logic. And I think Israel is different. Israel does see the reality of, uh, of you know, what could transpire from Iran. Colonel Eisen, is Israel on its own? I hope not. I think that there are still leaders, including right now President Biden as a leader. That doesn't necessarily mean that he has the Democratic Party behind him. It certainly doesn't mean that he has Congress behind him, let alone the U.S. public. But I think that he specifically understands not just the alarmist aspect. This is about a fundamental existential straight st um, state to the state of Israel. This is a real threat. When I look around broader for a moment, as I was listening both to the two of you, I want to be a dreamer because I'm an Israeli, so I'm an alarmist, I'm scared. And for a moment, I'd love to see a world where they do arrive, even if it's at the same agreement as before, which I wasn't exactly an admirer of, in that they would actually allow in the International Atomic Energy inspectors to come in and to visit those places. But in its own way, been there, done that, not too happy about that right now, but that would, that would actually be better than what is right now, where there's nothing whatsoever. Because I don't believe in Iran, because Iran is not just on the nuclear track, it is also on the track where it wants to export its revolution, where it is the dirty, nasty player throughout the Middle East and beyond that, where it is exporting its know-how, its capabilities, the terror capabilities. And for us in Israel, we find it very difficult to um, separate that nuclear quest from their destabilizing, that's a nice word, their violent export um, throughout the Middle East for me. And as Colonel Kemp said before, when you look from the UK, I think that Iran is far away. And no, I don't have a border with Iran. But for all of all, our audience, I will remind you all, I have a border with Syria. And Iran is in Syria. And so when I talk about this nuclear threat, it is on my border, even if Iran is 700 miles, 1,100 kilometers away. Palestinian so, Islamic Jihad is in Gaza in the West Bank. Absolutely. There's ways breaker total... taking place right now to try and uh, uproot them, of course, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I'd like one more question to Dr. Heinonen, if uh, I may, uh, as the only person in this panel, at least, who physically visited a nuclear installation in Iran and had dealings with the Iranians on multiple occasions. Uh, to what degree do you see uh, the Iranians as um, determined or, or capable uh, of making that decision to take that leap into uh, the weaponized realm of uh, nuclear uh, capacity? I don't think that have yet done the political decision when I look at the behavior. I would like to compare it pretty much to the situation with North Korea in 2003, when they put the first threat out by leaving the NPT, starting the reprocessing campaign. We saw from the satellite imagery and other sources that they are now separating plutonium. And then three years later, there was a test. And it's only after the test when, when the parties got together and uh, made this uh, agreement uh, with the North Korea to halt the program for a while. And it was a very poor agreement. It was just brought it to a halt without real verification how much material was there, just to confirm that the facilities were shut down because North Koreans felt that they are in a strong position and they didn't accept any other provision. So this was then the best achievable deal in the short term Indeed. for the 
for the parties. And I'm afraid that we might be in a similar route in, uh, in, uh, no, in Iran. And then I have another observation. I follow pretty closely also North Korea. There are more and more cooperation between North Korea, China, Russia, Syria, and Iran. And if there is a dispute, I wouldn't be surprised that this that dispute is not only with Iran, but some other players come to the picture, and it will be very, very difficult for the Western countries to deal two or three crises at the same time. Indeed. So, Colonel Kemp, uh, closing sentence. I think I, I I really think you know there's a major problem with pursuing the route of the of the JCPOA, and I I said before that, uh, or a replacement for it, I said before that um, we can't trust Iran on anything, and certainly not on a nuclear deal. The trouble with with coming to a deal and continuing to work towards a deal is that um, it it reduces the freedom of action of countries like Israel and the US if it decides to take military action against Iran, because it sort of legitimizes an Iranian position to have a deal in place. If Israel suddenly realizes that they've got to take action irrespective of the deal then it's much more difficult for them to do so now i'm sure that given the existential nature of the threat they will have to do so anyway but you know that will invite probably even greater condemnation from the international community given that there's this alleged deal at least in place colonel eisen i hope that we are ready i believe that we are ready i think that we can face this threat so on that sense, I want to make sure that we understand that Israel understands what Colonel Kemp was just saying, and we're not sitting around idly. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Heinonen, Colonel Kemp, and Colonel Eisen for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. <laughs>